So the testimony of Jesus mm. is the spirit of prophecy. Mm-hmm. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, this is a powerful verse because it's foundational to your understanding of the prophetic. All true prophetic ministry focuses on Jesus. The moment the focus of the prophetic ministry becomes about the prophet, it's no longer a prophetic ministry. The moment the prophetic ministry becomes primarily about something else, it's no longer a prophetic ministry. But so long as the prophetic ministry remains fixed, focused, attentive on Jesus himself, it's a prophetic ministry. Jesus is the focus of prophecy. Jesus is the centerpiece of prophetic declaration. Jesus is the purpose, ultimately, of the prophetic. If Jesus is the focus of prophecy, the Word is the foundation of prophecy. Mm -hmm. Now, if the Word is not your foundation, you're going to find yourself wandering into the strange and the bizarre. Right. I know of many anointed prophetic ministries that started well, but because the emphasis was on the gift, because the emphasis was on the wow factor, because the emphasis was on something else other than Jesus, over time, the focus began to change. Mm. And what happened was, in many cases, ministries shut down. Mm -hmm. Please hear me. People lost their minds. Right. You get into the prophetic, and if you're not grounded in the word, you'll lose your mind. You'll lose your focus. You will lose your sanity. Why? Because you're delving into the spiritual realm. When you're prophetic, you, you move into realms beyond this world. Mm-hmm. Think about that. Really think about what the nature of prophecy is. You are seeing, hearing, looking into, entering into a whole different realm. Mm. And if you enter that realm, if you catch a glimpse of that realm, if you listen to that realm, but you're not grounded in the word, you're not focused on the person of Jesus, my friend, you will lose your mind. You will lose your mind. You will lose your ministry. You will lose everything you hold dear in your spiritual life if you lose your focus on Jesus. So I want to give you these scriptures. I'm going to read a few scriptures just as a foundation because I need to. You really do need to hear this. I mean, I could just jump right into the nine signs. Right. But you really do need to hear this introduction because this is going to lay a firm foundation for you. Jesus is the substance of the spiritual realm. The moment you remove him from the equation, you have no absolute. Mm. You have no grounding and you're wandering, searching, flailing through the spirit world. Now, Jesus is the focus of prophecy, and the word is the foundation. 2 Peter 1, 19-21 says this, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, where unto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until that day and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here, the scripture is telling us that there is a firm foundation. The scripture is telling us that we do have a more sure word. Verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Mm. So, Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, the focus of prophecy. The word is the foundation of prophecy. Now, here's what prophecy does. 1 Corinthians 14, 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So now here... 
we see the three things that prophecy does. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. Now, exhortation and comfort, that's encouragement. That's comfort. Edification can sometimes be correction. Mm. So some people use this verse to try to say, well, that sounds too mean or that sounds too harsh. That couldn't possibly be the prophetic gift. When in fact, edification has to do with correction. Edification has to do with setting straight, making right. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Now, this is different than the office of the prophet. I'm talking about a prophetic nature or a prophetic gift. So what I'm going to give you here are nine signs of the prophetic nature. I'm not talking about the office of the prophet. I'm talking about prophetic nature. So the prophetic office would be a whole different message for a whole different time. And these signs wouldn't necessarily be the only things that indicate the office of a prophet. So I want to talk to you about nine signs of your prophetic nature. But before I do, Steve, how's the chat doing? So the chat's doing amazing right now. Again, guys, go ahead and like, comment, and share this stream. I think this message is so timely for a lot of people because we're living in times right now where we need clarity Uh, We need a new, fresh word from the Lord, especially with the things going on. So sit tight, guys. Stay focused with us. Uh, I left in the comment section. Make sure you're taking notes. So like I said, you never know what the Holy Spirit will drop right onto you while you're listening to this message. So continue to write notes, continue to like, continue to comment, and continue to share this stream. Okay, sign number one. Sign number one, discernment. 1 Corinthians 12.10 says, To another the working of miracles to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. This is 1 Corinthians 12.10. So this here is talking about the, the discernment or the discerning between two spirits. Now, let me make this clear. Being judgmental, being suspicious, Being negative is not the same as being prophetic. There are some people who are very, very, very suspicious, very, very, very cynical, very judgmental, and they try to pass off their cynicism as discernment when it's not. Mm. The gift of discernment is not the gift of criticism. It's simply the ability to see what spirit someone is coming in whether it be the Holy Spirit, whether it be a demonic spirit, whether it be the spirit of man. Keep in mind that when someone teaches something you don't like, or when someone preaches with the style that you don't prefer, or when someone looks a certain way that you don't trust, Hmm. that's when the flesh rises. I know certain people who, if someone with tattoos is talking, instantly they can't listen to it. Wow. I know other people, if they see a man in a suit, instantly their guard goes up, they can't listen to them. Wow. I remember my brother-in-law used to be in a band. It was a hardcore band. And if you don't know what hardcore music is, it's very loud music. I was never a fan of the music style. Um, but I did see the benefit that it had for a season in that there were many Christian hardcore bands going around the United States playing shows and preaching the gospel. And people would come by the hundreds, sometimes the thousands, to hear these bands, and that would be the opportunity that they would use to preach the gospel. And I remember my brother-in-law's band is playing, and their band is playing a song that's evangelistic, talking about coming to the cross, talking about getting your sins forgiven, and so forth. People got saved that night. People gave their hearts to the Lord, many of whom I know who are still saved to this day. They got saved at these hardcore shows. Again, I was never personally a fan, but the style of the music, though it was abrasive, carried a message that was powerful. And I'll never forget, there was a lady who attended that concert, 
and she's sitting in there, and you could just tell she's not happy with the music being played. She goes out to the parking lot. Someone followed her there and said, are you okay? And she's like near tears. She says, the Holy Spirit is just so grieved. The Holy Spirit is just so grieved by this music. Hmm. And she had the performance down. She had the, you know, the spiritual sounding voice and the tears going and whatnot. But that woman wasn't speaking for the Holy Spirit. I can tell you because even though I really, really, really disliked the music, I could see the power of God working. In fact, I saw demons. I kid you not. I saw demons manifesting at these hardcore shows. They would, they would sing. I can, Steve, mm -hmm. you remember some of these. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they would sing. And as they're singing, demons start manifesting in people. And, and teenagers started getting delivered from drug addictions and alcohol addictions right. and all sorts of things. It was powerful. Powerful. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at this wonderful move of the Holy Spirit. And this woman is sitting in the service, and because she didn't like the sound of the music, because the lights weren't bright enough for her, because the, the, the music reminded her of things that she thought were ungodly, she allowed her own personal feelings, her own personal emotions, to be mistaken for the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so she goes around saying, this grieves the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is so grieved. When in fact, the Holy Spirit was working. Hmm. The Holy Spirit was moving. Right. So the gift of discernment, or at least the ability to discern, which are one and the same, these, th these, these abilities are not in and of themselves the only sign that you need to know that you are prophetic in nature, though discernment is a prophetic gift. But it's important to know that this is a sign that you could be prophetic. The ability to see. In other words, you can see it coming before others can. You can tell when something's not quite right, and please be careful with that. That's why I'm mentioning the fact that some people go with their personal preferences. Hmm. For example, there's a friend of mine who I was working with for a long time trying to get him on the Sid Roth program. For those of you who don't know what the Sid Roth program is, it's a tremendous opportunity, and many of the ministries that I know that have been on the program saw wonderful growth after being featured on the show. So there was this friend of mine, and I told him, I said, if we can get you on the Sid Roth program, your ministry will explode. It's going to be a widespread reach that you'll, you'll gain. I already know it. I said, that audience would love you. And so for, I kid you not, maybe a year and a half, almost two years, we were working with different organizations, publishers, and the producers themselves, and trying to get my friend onto the program. And so one day... I'm sitting at lunch. Uh, Steve, you were there. Mm -hmm. We're sitting at lunch. It's me, Steve, Sid Roth, and some other people there who were going to be on the program. I don't remember who was on that day. And I thought, this is a great opportunity to bring this up. <clears throat> and so I said, Sid, there's this prophetic gift that you must know of. There's this person who's bold, who's powerful. I mean, I just went on kind of like the whole thing. And so Sid turns to one of the producers. He said, whoever David's talking about, get them <laughs> on the top of the list. And so I'm thinking, yes, we got it. It's done. So it all worked out. This person was able to get onto the program. And I'm watching the program. I'm excited. Like I see it come out on, on, on Sid Roth's Facebook. And I'm watching this. I'm going, oh, wonderful. Okay, finally, this guy gets on. And I was just rejoicing that we were seeing fruit from it already. Like after the first post, he's already starting to get a bunch of response. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Okay. This is awesome. Seeing ministries grow. So I'm cheering him on. I'm watching the video. And then I scroll down into the comment section, just because I like to read testimonies. I scroll down into the comment section and I see somebody put probably one of the most foolish statements I've ever seen. They said, I don't know. Something just doesn't sit right in my spirit with this. Mm. And I thought, if you were really talking about your spirit, your spirit would recognize this is of God. But see, here's what people do. They say, something in my spirit, something in my spirit. No, no, no. That's not the spirit. That's sometimes your own personal preference, mm. your own emotions, Come on. your own thought patterns, your own ideas about the way God should move. It could be your own jealousy. Wow. 
You see God raising someone, and because they are not you, your spirit has an issue with it. Supposedly your spirit. Now, that was interesting enough to see that. But when I'm watching this, I noticed other people began to comment on his page. So mm. you got to imagine this. I'm watching my friend who we worked about a year and a half to get him on. He gets on the show. And then I see this person put that foolish comment about this individual. And then they start to write, something doesn't sit right in my spirit. And then people start to pile on that. Someone else comments, you know what? I was going to say something, but I, was, I kept my mouth shut. Then I read your comment. Now I know this was mm. God. Mm. And that doesn't confirm anything. You ever notice that people do that? They look for people to confirm what right. they're supposedly discerning. Oh, I saw the same thing. Or, oh, I noticed it. Oh, yeah, to me, something seemed off as well. So I'm going to agree with you. And what that's called is confirmation bias. You can pick any man or woman of God. You can pick any move of the Holy Spirit. You can pick any church, any worship ministry, any YouTube channel, any Facebook page, anything that God is using, and you'll find a group of people who don't feel right in their spirit about it. And I'm quoting that. They don't feel right. This just doesn't sit right. And then they'll comment something or they'll say something and someone else, oh yeah, me too. And then that confirms it in their minds there. We heard right. from the Lord. That was the Holy Spirit telling us, no, no. It was just a group of jealous people, <laughs> critical people, judgmental people, Come on. Mm. unspiritual people commenting on this guy's feed and then jumping on to confirm supposedly what the Holy Spirit is saying. And we do these sorts of things all the time as the church. We say wow. foolish things like this. So discernment is a sign that you have a prophetic nature. But please don't mistake your own personal preferences for the voice of the Holy Spirit. They're not the same. And just because you don't like something, just because something challenges you. You know, I, I dealt with this myself. There was a couple instances where I went to go hear someone preach, and the preacher said something that I didn't like. So what did I do? Oh, my spirit just doesn't feel right about this. That's what I said to myself. This is not, not of God. And then I remember one instance in particular when I was watching this preacher, went to go see him preach. I'm listening to him, and I'm just kind of complaining to myself, you know, oh, that's not of God, or he didn't hear the Lord, or that, where's that in the Bible? You know, kind of like trying to affirm my own misgivings about what I was hearing. Hmm. So I get in the car, and I'm just telling myself on the ride home, that wasn't God, that wasn't God, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, no, you're just being convicted by what he said. Now, here's, here's, here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. He won't hold back because he loves us too much. So here I am sitting there, all critical, judgmental, arms folded. This, this is not of God. This is not of God. And the Holy Spirit says, no, you're just being convicted. And that's what happens sometimes. People preach things from the word of God that contradict beliefs that we hold dear, mm. ideas that are deeply rooted in our hearts. And when God tries to speak to us, we spiritualize our stubbornness. Please hear wow. me now, people wow, of God. Wow, wow. We spiritualize our stubbornness. Something's not right about that guy. Well, consider that that guy's speaking truth and you just don't like the truth. Mm. So when I talk of discernment, again, this is not the same as being judgmental, suspicious, negative, or anything like that. This is spirit-led truth in humility. Do you know one of the greatest ways to sharpen your discernment is the Word of God, not your personal preferences. Had I, had I not listened to the Holy Spirit, then I would have dismissed completely God using those hardcore bands that I was talking about mm. toward the beginning of this point. Right. I would have just dismissed them. Oh, I don't like the music. I don't like the look. I don't like the That's not God. All sorts of moves of the Holy Spirit. Now, if something contradicts the word, of course, we, we correct that. But you don't throw the whole thing out. You, you're, you're, you're the discerner of spirits, not the discerner of people. Come on. That guy is not of, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hmm. If it's a servant of God, 
it's, if it's a child of the king, if it's your brother, your sister, if you agree on the Lord, ask yourself, are you dismissing what you're discerning or are you dismissing the person as a whole? And remember, often this can be jealousy. Often this can be your emotions. It also could be your bad experiences with certain types of people. So if one preacher kind of reminds you of another preacher who did you wrong, guess what? You're going to somehow find a way, your flesh will try to at least, find a way to discern something in them that's off. Hmm. And that's not of God. So I'm going to move to my next point on the next sign. Um, I see Joanne commenting and Cara Mia says, that's good. Roseanne says, like Morgan Allen. LOL, that's right. Latest Ortiz, Cara Mia, Planet Shakers. God has given us the spirit to discern what's good and what is evil. That's so true. And then Tanaka Russell says, spiritualizing our stubbornness. Well, yeah, and that's what we do. So make sure you're not just being this critical, cranky, grumpy person <laughs> who doesn't like people who disagree with you or doesn't like people who are doing better than you or doesn't like people who don't look like you or who doesn't like people who don't sing the songs you sing or play the music you play. That's not discernment. That's the flesh. But a true sign of the prophetic person is discernment, the ability, the simple ability to tell what spirit someone is coming in. Uh, Steve, anything you want to add? I think that is so, so vital. Discernment is, is I believe, like Diga is saying, it's, it's the first step into understanding that um, as a whole. And I think it's, it's powerful, powerful so far. And people in the chat, they're, uh, they're ready. They're excited. Well, powerful times. I'm excited too. And I see sold out, says Jesus. And everyone, make sure you're liking, commenting, sharing. Someone asked me, why do you care so much about numbers? And it was a good question. And it's an important question that we ask ourselves. I care about numbers because numbers represent people and people have souls. So wow. I'm going to care about numbers until the gospel goes to the ends of the earth and everything has possibly been done that could be done for the advancement of the gospel. So I do care about numbers. Like, comment, share, like, comment, share. Don't forget to leave that like. Remember, you get to 1,000 likes. We do the book giveaway, 2,000 likes trip giveaway. Uh, make sure you're letting me know what you think. By the way, let me ask you, is anybody in the chat being checked by the Holy Spirit on this point concerning discernment? Maybe, maybe mm. you're saying, ooh, yeah, sometimes I do that. I, 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 I take my personal preferences and I try to pass them off as discernment. If that's mm -hmm. anybody in the comments, let me know. I see fire emojis, amen. Someone's saying this is great, praise God. Uh, more fire emojis. And by the way, I think if those of you didn't know, uh, I think they have the Nick Tejerina emoji available now yes. for chat members. So it's awesome. That's out there. Um, now, oh yeah, there they are. There's the Steve. There's Nick. We're all there. We're all <laughs> there. Um, let me see here. Uh, someone said me. Someone said yes, yes, yes. Uh, someone says taking notes. Someone says I love these teachings. Yes, yes, yes. So there's a lot of us. Okay. So by the way, you're not the only one. I do that too. Listen, we all mm -hmm. are works in progress. We all do this, and this is why we have to be very careful. When, when, we're, when we're coming against what we think is the enemy, we might just be coming against something that's different than what God is doing in us. And so that's very important. Now, if something contradicts the word, okay, then, then you, can, you can kind of distance yourself from that. But again, make sure you're actually hearing from the Holy Spirit and not just drawing on past experiences with people and kind of connecting the dots from bad experiences you had with churches or styles or right. methods and so forth. Like I know some people who can't step foot into a church because they're constantly discerning that, oh, the church is just a system that's corrupt, when in fact God mandated that we put these systems in place. The systems come from the Lord. Now, guys, can we turn off the AC if it's on? Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, you know, so I think these, these, these thought patterns are very complex sometimes. We, we sort of imagine that a church will be like the one we came from. And because of that, mm. we discern, supposedly, not really, but you know, we think we do. We're discerning, oh, something's not right here. But again, you're drawing on past experience or emotion. So be very careful with that. But a sign you could be prophetic is that you have discernment. Now, number two, this one is very interesting. Number two... You receive words of knowledge. Uh. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 8 says this, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit 
the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Now, when I first started, or when I was first beginning in ministry, I asked the Lord to place a prophetic gifting to complement the ministry. Now, I'm an evangelist with a teaching and healing gift. Those are the, that's the combination that the Lord gave me, and you have your combination. In fact, let me know in the chat, what's your combination of gifting, or are you still looking to discover it? So that, that's what he gave me. But I also asked him for the word of knowledge, because the word of knowledge pairs very well with the gift of healing. For example, last night, I said, there's a gentleman here, you have paralysis and numbness in these two fingers. I, I, I specifically pointed to the pinky and the ring finger, and I said, God is healing you right now. After the service, a gentleman runs up to me, and he goes, I was the guy, and he starts moving his hand up and down like this, and I've just found that that's a great combination of gifting, the gift of healing with the word of knowledge. God shows you what's happening as you're calling out the healings, and it's a beautiful, mm. beautiful thing the coming together of those two gifts. In fact, Miss Coleman operated in the word of knowledge and the gift of healing. But here the word of knowledge that's being described is information about the natural that was obtained through supernatural means. Here's mm -hmm. what the word of knowledge is. You want to know what it is. It's information about the natural that was obtained through supernatural means. So then... When I operate in the word of knowledge, when you operate in the word of knowledge, what's happening is that the Holy Spirit is giving you information in regards to the surroundings, to the person you're looking at, maybe that person's past. And the Holy Spirit is revealing this so that you can deliver a message. Now, the word of knowledge primarily deals with the past and the present. The gift of prophecy obviously talks about the future. But words of knowledge are prophetic in nature because you're hearing God. You're listening for his voice. He's speaking to you. And this is a powerful gift or a powerful sign that you could be prophetic. Now watch this. You may not even realize you're operating in the word of knowledge. You may not even recognize that this is a gift that's active in your life where you think, oh, I just kind of know things sometimes. Wait a minute, hmm. wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean you just kind of know things sometimes? That's a prophetic gift. Right. That's the working of the Holy Spirit in your life to where you're looking at people and you just know that they came from a certain kind of home. You just know that they're dealing with depression. You just know that they're pursuing some type of specific career that you know of. Mm -hmm. I remember this girl one time comes up to me after I got done preaching and she says, can you pray for me? I said, sure. She says, can you pray specifically about what God wants me to do? Now, let me be clear here. I very rarely respond to these kinds of requests because I, I can't force the Holy Spirit to just speak to me on command. That's not how right, it works for right. me at least. And she asks me, she says, can you tell me what God wants me to do. There's a career I want to pursue, but I'm not sure if I should pursue it. And I don't even think I had time to think about the words that were coming out of my mouth as they were coming out of my mouth. I said, yes, God says, become an RN. Wow. And her eyes got like, they went, they went really big. And she looked at me and she said, that was exactly what I wanted to know. Thank you. And she walked <laughs> away. But that was an unction that came on that was the word of knowledge. That was information about this person, information about their circumstance, information about their past. Now, the next sign is the word of wisdom, but let me talk a little bit about the word of knowledge along with the word of wisdom because it'll make for a nice transition and it will help give you a little bit of understanding, a little more understanding on these two gifts. Think about the fact that knowledge and wisdom are naturally occurring. So if I want knowledge about this room, I just have to look around the room. I see that Steve has his tea. I see that someone left a hat on the table to my right. I see Britain's wearing a blue shirt. See, I'm gathering information. I'm assessing. That information I'm getting is coming to me by natural means, by what I see and hear and experience in the world around me. Wisdom 
can also come by natural means. People have experiences over time that contribute to their wisdom. People have experiences over time that allow them to navigate certain circumstances with better understanding of those circumstances and the people involved. Knowledge and wisdom can certainly be acquired by natural means. But the gift of the word of knowledge and the gift of the word of wisdom are different than naturally occurring knowledge and naturally occurring wisdom in that they are natural pieces of information that come about through supernatural means. So the word of knowledge, though I could get the, the information naturally, I could go and just talk to someone and get to know them. I mm -hmm. could learn about their past. I could learn what car they drive, what hobbies they have, the name of their spouse. But I can also gain that through the Holy Spirit. The same thing goes for the word of wisdom, and it's the same portion of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 8. This is the Holy Spirit giving that wisdom. So word of knowledge is knowledge that comes about through supernatural means, and word of wisdom is wisdom that comes about through supernatural means. Think of the woman at the well in John 4. Jesus had the word of knowledge. He knew all about the, the, the woman's life. He was able to give details, specific details about who she was, what she did, what her past was like. And in the giving in those details, he was able to demonstrate the word of knowledge. Now, the word of wisdom is that daily navigation that the Lord gives to you. Think about Solomon and the Proverbs he wrote. Think about the fact that Joseph was able to interpret dreams. Dream interpretation isn't a word of knowledge. It's a form of a word of wisdom. Mm. The ability to navigate difficult circumstances, you may think that you just are good at figuring how to find solutions. You may think that you're just gifted in understanding people and reconciling relationships. That is a sign of the prophetic nature in you. R really think about this because this is a big one. You may just think, I'm going to say it again. You may just think that you're good at reconciling relationships. People come to you as a mediator. People come to you for advice. People come to you for wisdom on navigating circumstances. That is a prophetic nature in you. The fact that you can just know information about people, that's the word of knowledge. I had a friend who was very, very prophetic in nature, and he would meet people and just give out a date, oh, March 12th, <laughs> Wow, April 2nd. I watched this happen. I watched this happen with my own eyes. I heard it with my own ears. We would go and we would meet people. The moment he shook their hand, the first thing he would say to them, December 12th, November 4th, like he would, like that. And they would just be shocked. Like, how did you know my birthday? I remember this happened like a dozen times I saw it. They would say, how did you know my birthday? He says, I don't know. It's just something I do. And I thought, well, that was incredible that he was able to do that. And I asked him, what's the point of that? And he was telling me that he was just trying to exercise the gift of the word of knowledge. And I, I was amazed to see it in action. I can't say there was too much of a, of a purpose in telling people their exact birthdays, right. at least for that specific moment. But he was exercising the gift. Hmm. He was using what God had gave him, and he was demonstrating the prophetic. So, number one, signs that you know you're prophetic. These are important. Number one is discernment. Number two is the word of knowledge. Number three is the word of wisdom. Remember, word of knowledge is obtaining natural information by supernatural means. The word of wisdom is the gaining of wisdom for circumstances or difficulties by supernatural means. And again, you may think that these are just traits about you, things that just kind of occur. Oh, I'm always like that. I just kind of always know what's happening with people. No, no, that is prophetic. You think you're just good at reading people? You think that you just are good at protecting your loved ones from people who end up being corrupt? No, that's a prophetic nature in you. Hmm. So number one, discernment. Number two, words of knowledge. Number three, words of wisdom. Number four, all oh, this one's, this one's, this one's great. I mean, these are all great, but I mean, this one, I'm kind of excited to, to share it. Okay. Number four, prophetic dreams and visions. Ah, yeah. This is, this is a big one because 
Okay, it, let me start with this. Admittedly, there are some times that people put way too much emphasis on their dreams. Like, Brother David, I had a dream that an angel was dancing over me, sprinkling glitter, blowing a trumpet, <laughs> and there was a lizard who likewise had wings, and his name was Jerry. And I'm like, okay, okay, I don't, I, like, just go ask the Lord, because I, I don't know if every dream necessarily is something you should obsess about. Um, and I'm very confident that the Lord will make the message quite clear if it's him. Right. But while we know that there are some times that dreams are just dreams, it's also very clear in scripture that that dream you have, that dream that you have again and again and again, could very well be a prophetic message from the Lord. Job 33, 14 through 15. For God, oh, this is powerful. For God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. He speaks in dreams, in visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they lie in their beds. Mm. Matthew 2, 12. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. This is the wise men being warned in a dream. Joseph, likewise, warned in a dream. God can speak through dreams and visions. Amen. Now, the Bible also says in Acts 18, 9, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent. Now, Steve, check in with the chat. The AC was kind of messing with me, so yeah, I to sure. take another water break. So I know this is, uh, right here, this is such a great one. And I know I've already seen a few questions in the uh, chat section. So go ahead and continue to leave those questions. I'm actually gathering as many questions as I can while he's preaching and while he's teaching uh, to save for the very end. But yes, dreams and prophetic dreams and visions. So just to recap, I want to go ahead and go over a few of the points here. So just for my note takers out there, number one was discernment. So number one was discernment. Number two Word of knowledge, words of knowledge. Number three, words of wisdom. And now I'm on number four. And now he's on number four. Prophetic dreams and visions. So really, dreams are visions. So I know there's dreams and visions, and we talk about that. And, and in a way, they are different. But really, dreams should be under the category of visions. Dreams are visions in the night. There are things that God shows us while we lie in our beds, while we're sleeping, while we're in a certain sleep state. God speaks to us through dreams, and that's perfectly biblical. This is solid biblical truth. I can think of a couple situations where, for example, I had a dream about a demonic being. Now, it's a well-known fact, biblically speaking, that Christians can't be possessed or demonized or oppressed, but we can be affected by demonic deception. That deception becomes thought pattern. That thought pattern becomes feeling. That feeling becomes a way of acting. That acting becomes a way of living. Mm -hmm. And so then that creates the bondage based on our decisions, based on deception. Now, even though the enemy comes through deception, that doesn't mean there aren't open doors that we have in our lives that make us, or that, that doesn't mean that we don't have open doors in our lives that make us more susceptible to demonic deception. There are things that you do that can make you more susceptible to demonic deception. That's a fact. And so in my dream, I saw this shadowy figure. It, mm. was, it was really demonic. I remember in my dream, I'm lying down. So it's like a dream within a dream almost. I wake up in my dream. I'm still in my dream. And I'm lying in my bed. And I look over and I see floating in the center of my room this dark mist, like a dark oh, wow. cloud. And it begins to form and thicken. And in the center of the cloud, I could see like, like teeth. Oh, wow. Like a smile. All I could see was the smile and two eyes. I wrote about this in 25 Truths about Demons and Spiritual Warfare. And in my dream, the boldness of the Holy Spirit came over me. And I start rebuking. I said, in the name of Jesus, you have no right. You have to go. And this thing began to laugh at me, smiling. Wow. And I thought, this is odd because I know the scripture teaches very clearly that demons go immediately. 
And I was looking at this demonic being. Later, the Lord revealed this wasn't demonic influence in my life. He was showing it to me on behalf of someone else. Starts to laugh, smile. And I said, you have to go in the name of Jesus. I kept reiterating. I says, you have no right. And I says, yes, I do. It smiled, almost laughing as it said it. It said, wow. yes, I do. And I thought, how? And it answered me. It said, there's someone in your family who's practicing necromancy. Oh, my goodness. And then I woke up. I called my grandmother, who basically has information on the whole family tree. <laughs> she is the one that is contact with everyone, and she keeps up with the details on everyone's lives. And I asked her, I said, Nani, I said, Nani, I had this dream last night, and the Lord gave it to me as a warning for someone in our family I said, somebody's practicing necromancy. And without hesitation, she said, ah, uh, I know exactly who you're talking about. And I've been praying for them. Let me call them and tell them the dream that you had that's warning them. For those who don't know, my family came from the occult. My great-great-grandfather was a very high-ranking official in certain parts of the occult. And it was a very interesting past that we have as a family. So some of that... I still practice in certain, in certain uh, parts of my family. And so there, I mean, it, 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 was, it was a shocking dream to me. And I said, Lord, why was it that this demonic being was able to hold its place? The Lord made it clear to me that this was influence in someone else's life, but he gave me that warning for them, guys. Mm -hmm. He gave me the warning so that they might be set free from that influence that caused deception. Wow. And so that was one way that the Lord warned me. That was like a demonic warning, like a warning about the demonic, I should say. Another dream I had, by the way, in the chat, let me know. Have you ever had an interesting dream? Let me know a little bit about it in your, in your, your comment section here. Another dream I had was of this man of God. In fact, this was a recurring dream. This one was interesting here. So I, I, I had this dream over and over and over again about this man of God who I knew God called me to receive from. There are certain people that God will place in your life for the purpose of transferring mantles. And I knew that the Lord wanted to connect me with this man of God. And for several years, I had tried to walk through different open doors, but those doors, as I would walk through them, would, would slam shut in my face. And I began to ask the Lord to make that connection for me. I said, Lord, only you can do it. Only you can make that connection. And not just make the connection, but also make the connection and allow a relationship to form to where I could receive impartation. That was just God. It was God. And so in my dreams, this man would walk by me and I would try to grab the bottom of his suit coat just to, just to receive an impartation. In every single one of my dreams hmm. that I had like this, he would walk by and I would try to reach out for him, but he would walk by too fast or he would go into a room and they would shut the door and there'd be security on the outside or There'd be people all around him and I wouldn't be able to get to him. And several times over and over, I'd have this dream where this man of God would walk by and I wasn't able to catch that mantle. And then one night, I had a dream where he's walking by and as he's walking by, I reach out to touch his coat and I caught it. Wow. And I felt like this surge of power go through me. The moment I caught it, I felt the surge move through me and then that woke me up. I woke up in my room I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I caught him. I finally caught the coat that I was trying to grab in all these dreams that I was having. Sure enough, within a week or two, I get a call one day from my brother, Michael, who used to work in our office in California. Now he, he still works with the ministry, but he's in Texas. He answers the phone and it's somebody from this man's ministry who reached out to us. We didn't even have to go and reach out to them. They reached out to us and said, we want to make this connection. And I thought, this is just incredible. Mm. I just had that dream where I caught it, and there it is. Within wow. a couple of weeks of that dream of catching them, we get this random phone call. They left a voicemail on our ministry line, and that was it. Went in, and God, made, God did the rest from there, and the rest is history. And it came, the confirmation, through dreams. I've also had visions. God's shown me visions of the ministry. You know, I looked at the cameras, I look at the jib, I look at all. I saw all of this when I was 14. All of it. 
I saw how it would operate. I'm not saying in full detail, but I knew what the structure would be like. I knew how the setup would kind of be arranged. And this was all something that God showed to me when I was 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. I saw it all. The Holy Spirit revealed it. He didn't show me how it would come to pass, but he gave that vision. I had another vision of these fields. This is another one I had one time. I had a vision of these fields. And in these fields, I could look and see it was far down the line. The, the, the horizon was, was, was very, very far from me. And in these fields, I could see these workers all working. And there's nothing but dirt. It's dry. It's hot. They're sweating. They're working. And with every movement, they're kicking up dust on themselves. And I thought, that does not look pleasant. I, I don't necessarily <laughs> want to join in on that. But what they were right. doing is they were preparing the harvest field. They were, they were, they were, they were tilling the ground. And so I see them, and then I hear thunder. And off in the distance, I see these clouds beginning to roll in. And as the clouds roll in, rain begins to fall. And as rain begins to fall, the workers become refreshed. And I saw these thick drops of rain, like thick drops. And when a drop of rain would touch the ground, instantly a piece of vegetation would sprout. Wow. It wouldn't even, it, would, it wasn't like these little, little, little sprouts it would it would grow to this full-grown um plant and i was seeing as the drops were dropping in the dirt boom there goes another one and then another drop and then boom there goes another one then another drop and it was happening all over the field and the lord spoke to me he said you've sown the seeds i'm about to bring the rain wow and this was in a vision i wasn't a dream i wasn't asleep i saw this in a vision as i was praying he said You've sown the seeds. I'm about to bring the rain. He said, tell my people, whatever you've sown will grow. And I, I, I took that as both an encouragement as a warning and a warning. It was an encouragement and a warning. You've sown the seeds. I'm about to bring the rain. So the things you've sown that were evil, they're going to bring forth evil. The things you've sown that were good, they're going to bring forth good. He says, you've been sowing I'm about to bring the rain. There was much more to the vision than that, but that's just kind of an example wow. of how the Lord works with that. But if you have dreams and visions, maybe you have dreams and these things come to pass, or you have dreams about people that kind of give you more insight on, not, 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 I'm not talking about suspicion. I'm talking about legitimate insight into people. And you might just dismiss them and say, oh, well, sometimes I have these dreams. No, no, that is God working in you. Listen, that's God working in you. If you've ever had a dream that's come true, just leave a one, the number one in the comment section. Drop a one in the comment section. If you've ever had a prophetic dream come true, or maybe like you have this daydream almost. You know, visions are almost like daydreams, except they're more vivid and they capture your attention. Maybe you've had these visions and you think you're just daydreaming, but you get caught up in it and then something happens regarding that or something very similar happens with that or you see something in the future that mm -hmm. comes to pass all of these things are prophetic look at all these people look at all of you guys have experienced this mm -hmm. people of god this is the prophetic in you so let god confirm it today in jesus name this is the prophetic in you and we're barely on key number four <laughs> okay so number one is discernment number two words of knowledge Number three, words of wisdom. Number four, prophetic dreams and visions. Number five, foresight. Okay, so remember, word of knowledge is about the past and the present. Word of wisdom is about navigating the circumstance. But foresight, the prophetic, that is looking into the future. That's God speaking to you about things that will be that have not yet been revealed. So prophecy about the future. Mark 8, 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed after three days rise, and after three days rise again. So here Jesus is predicting that he will suffer, that he will die, that he will rise from the dead. That is the prophetic in action. Matthew 12, 25. Jesus knew their thoughts. Now that is a powerful truth in and of itself. But Jesus had both foresight and what? Insight. 
Mm. Foresight and insight. So two more keys here. Number five is foresight. Number six is insight. So foresight is when I see the future. I look into what will be. Insight is when I see the hearts and minds of people. 1 Corinthians 14, 24 through 25 says, but if, you, but if all of you are prophesying and unbelievers are people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed. Wow. And they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring God is truly here among you. So Jesus would know their thoughts. The scripture talks about the thoughts being exposed of the unbeliever in the church meetings that we have. The Bible talks about foresight. So these are two very powerful keys. Foresight, the look into the future, the glimpse of the things that are to come. Insight, what is in the heart of people. Now, again, we have to be very careful we have to be, I'm throwing myself in there with you, okay? We have to be very careful that we're not mixing our emotions, preferences, ideas, paradigms, mindsets, and perspectives in with this gift. We must decrease so he can increase. It's done in humility. It's done in humility. Remember, none of this, well, that just doesn't sit right with my spirit. Wait a minute. Is that your spirit or is that your emotion? Is that because you don't like the truth that's being preached? Come on. Is that because you don't like the style of the haircut of the person? Whatever hmm. it may be, don't mix it in. But foresight is in regards to the future. And God confirms this, obviously, because the things come to pass. Insight is looking into the hearts and minds of people. Now, this does not mean that you can read minds. This does not right. mean that we are mind readers. This does not mean that we have telepathy and we have the power to look around and see everyone's thoughts. If that's happening to you all the time and you can't shut it off, I recommend going to, to seek help. Go get help with that. That's not necessarily the sign of a spiritual gift. It could be, but remember, there's peace that comes with the prophetic too. Amen. So then, this gift of insight, it comes on people in certain moments. I remember one time I was ministering in San Diego, and I brought the people up. I'm praying over them. The power of God's moving. And there's this altar filled with people. I'm standing over them, ministering the word of God, praying, prophesying. My eyes are closed, hands are lifted. And I hear this boy yelling to my left, I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory. I want to mm. see your glory. Telling the Lord. I stop and I turn toward him. And I pointed at him. I said, you just asked to see God's glory. And he wants you to know he's going to touch your life right now. And the power of God came on him. Wow. I found out afterwards that that little boy was not shouting. That little boy was not even speaking. That little boy was not even whispering. Wow. That little boy was thinking, praying in his mind, I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory. And I picked it up in the prophetic. I'm not a mind reader. I can't just turn this on and off whenever I'd like. It was just a supernatural moment. That's all I can say about it. There's nothing other than that to be said. It was a supernatural moment. And I heard in the spirit this little boy's thoughts. I heard his thoughts. I heard what was going on in his mind, in my mind, in that moment of supernatural power. Only God can do that. Now that is insight and God will show you these things. It's not necessarily that you see in people. It's that you're seeing in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit sees in people. So I look through the Holy Spirit's eyes, not my eyes. Wow. There's no, there's no natural means of acquiring this, okay? There, there's no natural means of, of even confirming this outside of what the person can confirm what was going on in their hearts. You can't say, Lord, I want that, and, and practice all these different things to get it. You, and same thing goes with dreams and visions. You can, you can position yourself in the spirit to receive more prophetic insight, but you can't do anything to directly gain it. You get what I'm saying? It's, it's about positioning myself in the spirit. It's about surrendering my ear to the Lord. So I can position myself to listen. I can quiet the things around me so that I can listen, but I can't make God speak anything. So when I talk about sharpening the prophetic gift or stirring up that gift or becoming more prophetic, I'm not talking about 
acquiring words of knowledge. Or here's how you search out for the words of knowledge. No, no, don't get into that. That's like new ageism, guys. Mm. But rather, I'm talking about how to hear the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about how to yield to the Holy Spirit himself. And in yielding to the Holy Spirit himself, you become positioned to receive more dreams and visions. You know, I have more dreams and visions when I pray at night because mm -hmm. I go to sleep praying in tongues. Oh, wow. I go to yeah. sleep when I, I mean, I, I call me crazy, but I go to sleep thinking in tongues. Hmm. I, I say, Holy Spirit, whatever you want to think through me, think it. Now, I can't claim to prove that that's scripturally something I can back up. It doesn't contradict the scripture, which is important, but it's not something I teach dogmatically, but that's just something I do. Holy Spirit, take over my thoughts too. Even think through me. And there are times when I'm in that realm, praying at night, where I do feel like I'm no longer here. Wow. I get taken to a different place. Mm -hmm. And in that season, or in that moment... When I go to bed, dreams and visions. When I wake up, discernment, insight, prophecy, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. Why? Not because I'm acquiring the gift. Not because I'm forcing God to speak in ways he's not wanting to speak. You can't do that. All you can do is position yourself to hear. Anyone that ever tells you here are the keys to getting more of this or getting more words of knowledge... Get, be very, very cautious. I'm not saying cancel the person. I'm saying like a watermelon, eat the watermelon, spit out the seeds, okay? Don't take in everything that you're told. Have biblical foundation. So in the terms of words of knowledge, dreams, visions, and so forth, make sure that you realize that you can position yourself in the spirit, but you cannot force him to speak. So Come on. I want to make that very clear. Powerful. So... Number one, discernment. Number two, words of knowledge. Number three, words of wisdom. Number four, prophetic dreams and vision. Number five, foresight. Six, insight. I'm going to read seven, eight, and nine in just a moment. Let's check on the chat. And guys, I do apologize. The air conditioning is messing with my, my, my speaking voice here. So I will take another water break. And Steve? So if you didn't know, I mean, everybody in the chat has been saying it. We just hit 1,000 likes on this video, on this stream. So congratulations, everybody. Give yourself a round of applause. Amazing, amazing job. Our next big goal is 2K. If you guys can get, get us to 2K, 2,000 likes, it's going to be powerful. It's going to be amazing. 2,000 while something. we're live. While we're live. It's gonna be, uh, we're going to be doing something very, very special. So very proud of everybody. Awesome, awesome job. Okay, guys. So... I see the chat lighting up here. Chris says it sounds like it went too fast. Sorry. Oh, by the way, guys, don't smash the like button. We need it. Gently click it. <laughs> That's what we say here at ETV. A little more class to it. Gently click the like button so that you can help us spread our reach. Turn it from gray to blue. Push its sorrows away. It's oh so satisfying when you see that colorless, lifeless, dull thumb go from gray to blue. I promise you it's... A small amount of satisfaction but go ahead and click that gently click it again don't break it we need it uh, but gently click the like button every single one of you so that you can help us spread our reach okay number seven passion for god's word ah. jeremiah 20 8 through 10 when i speak the words burst out violence and destruction i shout so these messages from the Lord have made me a household joke. Now stop here for a second. Jeremiah is talking about the fact that when he speaks the word of the Lord, he becomes the laughingstock. People turn against him. You will find, as a prophet of God, that when you declare truth, people turn against you. Hmm. Oh, you better be ready for that. No, 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 no. I'm not saying when you share your opinion. I'm not saying when you, when you share some weird new doctrine that's not backed by Scripture. I'm not saying when you share what you received in your emotions. I'm saying when you declare the message God has declared. When you speak that truth, please hear me now. You are prophetic. You who are responding to these signs. You're prophetic, and I need you to hear this. I love you too much to not tell you this. 
People will turn on you when you speak truth. People will accuse you when you speak truth. People will make up lies about you when you speak truth. Keep declaring the truth anyway. Shout it from the rooftops. Declare it from the mountaintops. Let your voice rise up like a trumpet. Cry aloud, spare not. Speak forth the word of God. When you begin to declare truth, not only will the world turn on you, religious people turn on you too. God's people may at times turn on you. They turned on Moses. They turned on Jesus. When God gives you a prophetic word, it rattles cages. It upsets the foundations of religious establishments. Declare it anyway. Speak that truth that God put in you. Like Jeremiah said, fire in my bones. So these messages from the Lord, Jeremiah writes, have made me a household joke. But if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak his name, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. I have heard the many rumors about me. They call me the man who lives in terror. They threaten if you say anything, we will report it. Even my old friends are watching me, waiting for a fatal slip. He will trap himself, they say. And then we will get our revenge on him. Wow, wow, wow. People of God who are prophetic, if you can't identify with that, then you've mm. not operated in the prophetic yet. But I trust that most of you know exactly what that's like. See, a prophetic word isn't a just a thus saith the Lord hmm. shall rain down glory from the mountaintops. Those are wonderful. Those are encouragements. You know when you really start to stir things up is when you bring a prophetic word of correction. Ooh. When you call people to repent. When you call for biblical order. When the word of God is your passion and you call things out that are out of alignment. Prophetic word isn't just about the future. A prophetic word can be a correction, not according to your preferences, people of God. We have, again, I'm throwing myself in there. We have to be careful. A prophetic word will stir things up and people will speak against you. The wait for you to trap yourself. The wait for you to slip up. The plot against you. The plan against you. They'll talk about you behind your back. They'll do anything they can. They'll even try to intimidate you. They'll do anything they can to keep you from speaking that truth. Do you know why? Because the truth works. The truth has power. So all anyone can do against the truth is silence it. Because once it's out, it's out. And this is what prophetic people do. They carry a passion for the word of God in their hearts. They have more of the word, not less. We have to be rid of this mindset that the less of the word of God that we have, the more prophetic we are. I've seen it all too many times in fact, I'll just use myself. I used to do it often. I would grab my notes right before I was about to preach. And I would say, I had these notes. And I'd crumple them up. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, I was looking for a paper to crumple, but I need all these. <laughs> yes, I, I would crumple up the notes. And I would say, I was going to preach this. And I'd crunch it up. And I'd say, but God, as I threw the notes, wants to move. Now, sometimes that is the Lord. Yes, sometimes God says, no preaching right now, just pray. Sometimes he'll do that. But this mindset that the word of God is somehow dry, 
and that prophesying is the refreshing that we're looking for. It's dangerous. It's it, you're you're putting your your gift and your calling in danger mm. when you don't reverence the word. Right. Hear me again. You are putting your prophetic calling in danger when you don't reverence the word. That's the mindset people have. Oh man, God moved. He didn't even get to preach the word. <laughs> That's what I used to say. Oh man, it was so great. He preached maybe five, 10 minutes. And then after that, it was just God. Whoa. Again, I'm not saying that can never happen. There are services where that will be the case. But fundamentally speaking, the word should be your foundation of ministry. Amen. Remember, Jesus is the focus of prophecy. The word is the foundation of prophecy. When you remove the word from your prophetic ministry, you start to declare your opinions mm. and call them prophetic words. Wow. 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 When you remove the word from your prophetic ministry, you start to prophesy out of your imagination and say that it's a word from God. No, no, true prophets love, know, defend, and reverence the word. They put the word high above their opinions. They put the word high above dreams and visions. They put the word high above words of knowledge. Those are all great. We need them all. We should experience them all. And I hope we have more dreams and visions. I hope we have more words of knowledge. I hope we have more gifts of prophecy at work in the church. But we cannot forget the word. True prophetic people love the word. I kid you not. A friend of mine told me that he went to a church service. I don't know who it was. I never named preachers, so this is about no one in particular. Years ago, a friend of mine told me a story about how he had, at the time, years ago, attended a meeting where this guy was prophesying. It was a local church. No one on television or the internet. Nobody would know. Just some local church he went to. And this guy gets up, and he closes the Bible. He says, I don't really want to read from this today. This just confuses me. Let's just prophesy. <laughs> I heard that I said, are you kidding me? Confu confuses you. It's, if the word of God, let me make this straight. If the word of God causes you confusion, it's because you're clinging to lies. Mm. The only time there can be confusion is when you try to put two mindsets together. I'm confused. This confuses me. You know why? Because you're clinging to lies and trying to fit them into the word. And it's not going to work. Hmm. You're trying to force God to say something he's not saying. And be very careful because if you prophesy out of your imagination, it will, it will come back to bite you. If you prophesy just out of your own emotions, it will come back to bite you. I understand that we should be gracious. And I understand that we should exercise our gifts. And I understand that it takes time to sharpen spiritual gifts. So I don't want to scare anyone out of prophesying. But I do want to say this, if God's not speaking to you, you're going to look like a fool when what you prophesy doesn't come to pass. Hmm. There needs to be more reverence for the word, what he's actually saying. And, and, and if, you're, if you're more familiar with the word of God, the more familiar you are with the word, that is the written word, the clearer the prophetic becomes. The clearer you can hear his voice. Well, that's how it works. My foundation is the word. My foundation is what he says in the scripture. And from there, I build my foundation of the understanding of this word. You want to see a true move of God? Reverence the word. So that's number seven. Prophetic people are passionate about his word. We don't, we don't take our notes and go, oh, I'm just going to prophesy today. Listen, listen, listen. Jesus is the focus of prophecy. You, if you have a service and all you're doing is prophesying, and demonstrating how accurate you are with words of knowledge, you're in danger. Your soul is in danger. Please hear me. If all you do is demonstrate the gift, but don't show the glory of God, hmm. if all you do is move in power, while never reverencing that presence, you're in danger. You're in danger. 
that's borderline witchcraft. I call it charismatic witchcraft, power demonstrations without Jesus. It all points to man. And I don't say that to anyone to attack anyone. I say that because I love the prophetic and I care about your soul. I care about you. God has raised you for such a time as this. Don't allow your prophetic gift to be polluted by New Ageism. Come on. By commercialism. Let it be a beautiful expression of the heart of God that points to the Son, Jesus. And in that, you'll always know the peace of God. In that, you will always know the true presence of God. If you'll make that commitment today to always point to Jesus and to make the word your foundation, I want you to type right now the word amen. Type it. That's, that's your public declaration. Even if you're watching this on the replay, you say, make that your commitment. Say amen. Just type it right now. A public declaration that I will make the word the foundation of all prophetic expression. I will keep Jesus as the focus. I want to see that. God bless you. God bless you. I see all those confirming this. Please, please, please don't pollute the prophetic with commercialism. Please, I Amen. beg of you, don't pollute the prophetic with emotionalism or new ageism or any ism. We just want Jesus. That's all prophecy is. Prophecy is to point people to Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Come on. So, so far we have number one, discernment. Number two, words of knowledge. Number three, word, word of wisdom. Number four, Prophetic dreams and visions. Number five, foresight. Number six, insight into hearts and minds. Number seven, passion for God's word. Number eight, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. We need both word and spirit. And while I prepare my next point, Steve, check in with the chat. I'm going to take another water break. So as Diga said right now, go ahead and type amen in the chat. I see the amens just flying by the screen. So you guys are doing amazing. But that point that he made previously is such so vital. I mean, the Word is our foundation, and if we're not rooted correctly, if we're not in the Word, things will get off. So just again, remember, read, read, simple, read your Bibles. Read your Bibles. Very simple, very simple. Powerful that stuff. That daily practice of the, the Scripture, the Word, will make all the difference in the world. Now, number eight is sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. As I said, we need both the Spirit and the Word. If you have just the Spirit with no Word, you lack foundation. You have inspiration, but people trail off into strange, bizarre things. If you have the Word but no Spirit, you have information. You have the truth, but no experience of that truth. The Word gives you information. The Spirit gives you inspiration. Actually, I should say the word gives you revelation. I think that's a better way to put it because information, that's just in the natural. The word gives you revelation. The spirit gives you inspiration. Together, they bring transformation. We need both the word and the spirit. Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit is not just about how clearly you hear him, but how quickly you respond when he speaks. I'm going to say it again. Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit is not just about how clearly you hear him, but how quickly you respond when he speaks. This is so key. So <laughs> there's a story I tell. Don't ask me how, okay? It's embarrassing, and I'm embarrassed to even be telling this story. <laughs> I burned my hand making oatmeal. Um, <laughs> my wife came in, and she told me, why are you pouring the water into the oats? Just pour the oats into the water. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, that's much safer than the way I was doing it, trying to balance and get it right. But I did, I did burn my hand uh, while making oatmeal. And there was this little burn mark on my thumb right here. And, you know, it was very sensitive. So sensitive that when someone would shake my hand and touch that part of my thumb, I would pull back instantly. It was a reaction. So sensitivity is not just about how clearly you hear him, but how quickly you respond when he speaks. 
Are you sensitive to the touch of the Spirit? When He speaks, we need to move. Sensitivity is about how quickly you react to what He's t- telling you. It's about how responsive you are to His instructions. How responsive are you to the instructions of the Holy Spirit? Hmm. When He speaks to you, how long does it take for you to speak what He says to speak? When he speaks to you, how long does it take you to correct those things he's talking to you about? This is sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, every believer should have sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, but those who are prophetically graced have an inclination towards sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. When I was born, my parents prayed over me that I would be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. But not only was I sensitive to the Holy Spirit, I was born very sensitive to the spiritual realm. Mm. And you, because you're prophetic, you identify with that. Maybe you were always kind of aware of the spiritual world around you, aware of the buzzing activity of life in the spiritual realm. Maybe you knew or just sensed the warfare for your soul. So as a kid, I had supernatural encounters. I saw demonic beings. I saw things on people. I heard the voice of God. I was recognizing spiritual things at a very early age because I was born with that sensitivity. Mm. Now, prophets, prophetic people are born or gifted or graced with or born again with certain inclinations, certain traits. Remember this. Your strength is your weakness and your weakness is your strength. What do I mean by that? For instance, I'll use me as an example And then I'll use Steve as an example. Hmm. I'm very, very details-oriented. I really like to make sure that things are done correctly. Now, in the strength of that, when I write books, they're very detailed. I give you the information you want. People read my books and they say, it's funny, right when I think of the questions, you give me the answer. Because I'm writing it thinking, what's the next question they'll ask after I answer this? Um, I like for everything to be done with quality. That's why Tim and I get along so well. We're both very details-oriented. However, even though that's a strength, that can become very tormenting. And I say that jovially. I don't mean that literally tormenting. It can become troublesome or problematic when I bring that details, that attention to details into every aspect of my life and I become a perfectionist. And I, I'm looking at all the flaws and every little thing. When you're a perfectionist, it's hard to enjoy anything that's succeeding because you can always see how it can be a little better. When I preach a message, I see lives changed. I see people getting their hearts right with God. I love that. But when I'm on the car ride home, I'm asking the team, hey guys, how was that? Was that okay? Because I feel like I missed it here. I feel like I wasn't clear here. Even this broadcast, as I did this broadcast, I'm thinking of all the times that I messed up or stuttered or fumbled over a word while reading scripture. That's all I'm going to be thinking about once this is done. And you, of course, being touched by God's power. But that is a strength and a weakness. Stephen's strength and weakness. Can I tell you (laughs) your your weakness and your strength? There's a lot of them, Steve, but can I tell you one of of the things, one of my favorites on you? Yeah. You don't care. (laughs) You just don't care. And I mean that as a strength. Anything goes wrong, this guy's got peace like a river. He's just, <laughs> he's just, he's just floating. He's good. But that sometimes can turn into you forget things, right? <laughs> right, right. Like yeah. uh, certain um, things on your calendar or maybe to pick something up from the store. Would you say that's both your strength and your weakness? I would say, yeah. So Steve has a strength and a weakness. You have a strength and a weakness. So prophetic people, your strength is that you're very sensitive Your weakness is that you're very sensitive. I'll say that again. Your strength is that you're very sensitive. 
Your weakness is that you're very sensitive. Some of the most moody people I know are prophetic people. <laughs> and it's just the reality. And, and the people said, amen. You know, you get in these moods. You have these mood swings. Why? Because you, you sense things in the spirit realm. God doesn't want to change that sensitivity. He wants to capture it. He wants to cultivate it. He wants to direct it. For example, my phone is being charged right now on a power grid. This wire that I'm using to charge my phone, this wire directs the power and makes it productive. And my phone is charged. Now, if I were to touch that same current of power without the wire, it would harm me. <laughs> Why? Because... It's the same power, but it's not being directed. Mm. That sensitivity you have in the spirit, God gave it to you. But make sure you're directing it. Make sure you're not becoming defensive and moody and critical and cynical and grumpy and isolated and suspicious of everybody around you. Make sure that along with that sensitivity, you have peace. You have joy. That you're not delving into every conspiracy theory that the prophetic world presents to you. That you're not treating every dream as something you need to obsess about or you start to feel guilty because you didn't get the, the meaning of that dream and you're wondering if God's angry with you for not understanding what he was speaking to you. Or you're, you're, you received a prophetic word from someone that maybe just wasn't accurate. But instead of saying it wasn't accurate because you're so sensitive to the prophetic, you want to honor it, you're thinking, well, I don't want to just dismiss it. And so you live in confusion because someone gave you an inaccurate word. Mm. See, so these are things that you have to learn about yourself. Prophetic people are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. They're sensitive to the spirit realm. And so you can, if you're not careful, you're going to live in this tension. You're going to live in this paranoia almost. You're going to live in this lack of peace, lack of joy, all wrapped up and tangled in your emotions. That's not a good place to be. And so as a prophetic person, you have to recognize you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Yes, but you're also sensitive. And that has to be acknowledged. Once you acknowledge your own personal weaknesses, then you can begin to capture them. I'll use myself as an example again. I have this trait where I think about all the possible outcomes. So when planning for something, plan, like I'll tell you where it's good. My ability to see the outcomes helps me when I'm putting together a teaching. I can see where people might misunderstand something I'm going to say. Now, I haven't perfected my teaching gift yet. Sometimes I say things that people go, what are you talking about? I'm like, okay, back to the drawing board. You got to rework that. But that ability to be able to see all the possible outcomes doesn't work so well when you're driving <laughs> because then I'm all tense looking. Okay, that guy can cut me off here. That guy is speeding. That guy coming up behind me. There's not enough distance between me and him. And so I get really tense when I'm driving. Sometimes the Lord, for the most part, I, I think I have a good handle on it, but sometimes I get really worked up. Why? Because I'm imagining all the possibilities. Now that's not necessarily a problem because it did save me from a car accident one time. But if I allow it to cause me to be just this tense, angry, paranoid person, that's not good. So there, again, is something that was captured. That ability to see mm. what the possible outcomes are. In the case of teaching, it's great. In the case of driving, I kind of got to curb that a little bit. And so you have to ask yourself, what is that like in you? What is that thing about yourself that is a strength but also weakness? I'm telling you, it's sensitivity. It's sensitivity to the spirit realm. And so you as a prophetic person may be able to see things in the spirit, but is it possible? Hear me now. Is it possible that maybe you're the type of person who's easily offended? Hmm. Is it possible that maybe you're the type of person to hold grudges? Maybe, and, and see, we spiritualize them. Well, I'm not bitter. That person just has a bad spirit. See, it works that way. And so I want to encourage you. 
capture that. Don't get lost in that confusion, the heaviness. I'll, I'll never forget one time I was preaching for a pastor and I was going around the room giving words of knowledge, just prophesying over people. And I saw all sorts of things. Prophetic people, we, we carry burdens. We carry burdens that are not ours to carry. Mm. You look at the people, you're moved with compassion, you see them, and what do you do? You start to wear what you see on them. He took me to the back room, his office, pulls me aside. He says, hey, you leave those burdens here. I said, what? He goes, I can see you're carrying the heaviness from the people. He said, you leave those to God. Those aren't yours to carry. You as a prophetic person have to know that those things that you're sensing coming on you are not yours to carry. They're the Lord's. And so we may connect with people. So that sensitivity is great because you can see when someone is in trouble, but that sensitivity is not so great when you take their trouble and make it yours. Mm. Now, of course, the scripture says to bear one another's burdens, but I'm talking about bearing it in an unhealthy way to where you have no joy or peace or you can see the fakes. You can see things that are unfolding in our world and you become worried about the future. You become worried about what's happening. Don't worry. Don't worry. Jesus is the focus of prophecy. Amen. So before I get to my next point, tell me, prophetic people, do you have that sensitivity? Let me know about it in the comment section. Steve, how's the chat doing? Chat's doing amazing. And like uh, you were saying in this last uh, few points here, everybody, I think, can kind of agree the overall arch and the overall theme of what you're talking about is understanding the Holy Spirit. And I think um, when we start to realize that and start to harness that, I think these keys on being prophetic are going to flow so easily. So powerful, powerful message. People are receiving. I've seen so many comments of people saying, wow, wow, this really has changed my life. I mean, they're, they're flying by already. So this message is touching many that are watching. So and powerful. they're asking, how do I help myself? Well, ground yourself in the word, in prayer, in worship. Just give it to Jesus. I know that doesn't sound easy, but you got to just stop obsessing about it. Arlene, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Terry, right on like you know me. Well, we know each other. We are the spirit family, you know. Uh, Brenna says, dreams. Uh, Denise, anxiety and sensitivity. Denise, that is right on, Denise. Mm. That is exactly it. Sensitivity can so easily become anxiety. And that is a very excellent point. Great job on that point, Denise. Um, DM, I see man, fire. And Roseanne says, yes. Um, Pamela says, excellent message. Stace says, yes, Lord. Letitia put fire emojis. Edward says, yes, I have that sensitivity that's become my weakness. Let it be your strength, my friend. Let it be your strength. Uh, Tammy says she identifies. Ayayi says, ground yourself, root yourself. That's right. You got to brace yourself. Rebecca, not about o obsessing over perfection. Yeah. Uh, Miss Tish says, let go and let God. The old cliche holds true, doesn't it? DM, it says, burning desire of the Holy Spirit. Tiffany says, so true. Well, God bless you all. I'm going to get into the ninth and final point. I'm glad to see this is helping you. And I'm hoping this is helping you to identify a prophetic gift because I know that there are many of you watching who are, in fact, very prophetic and we're very thankful to the Lord for what he's doing in your life. Okay, number nine. Here we go, number nine. Boldness in warning. Now, I don't have a specific verse for this. But if you look out through the entire Old Testament, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jonah, even though he ran, these prophets all throughout the Old Testament were given messages of warning. They were given messages of correction. Now, God doesn't call people to fall in love with correcting. I think some people fall in love with the authority. They love the idea that they're the ones to bring correction because they think it demonstrates their authority. But correction is to be brought about not in anger, not in trying to prove a point, not in trying to win an argument. Correction, if it's from God, is brought about in love. 
Amen. And that love inspires boldness. People who have a passion for the word of God. Remember, that passion is key. Because it is the passion for God's word that brings compassion for God's people. It's the passion for God's word that brings compassion for God's people. What do I mean? Well, if I'm passionate about what God says, it means I'm sold on what God says. I'm convinced about what God says. And that produces in me the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth causes me to look and see people's lives and go, oh my goodness, they're in danger. Oh my goodness, they're not living right. Oh my goodness, mm. they're off on a doctrine or something like that. That's when correction comes. Now, correction, biblically speaking, is to be done in private. The correction right. of sin is to be done in private. And then you move up the certain modes of correction. Um, this doesn't mean you go around doing theological debates. Because if God is going to correct a doctrine, he's just going to give you the truth. I found that when you correct doctrines that are out of place, the best thing to do is not to attack the person teaching that doctrine, unless, of course, they're under your authority, like in your movement or a leader in your church. And even then, you don't attack them. You bring them in and you correct it in that way. The best thing to do is to take deception and compare it to the Word of God and say, here's what the Word of God said, so this is why this is not true. There's no need to mention people. There's no need to attack people. Right. And as prophets of God, you must be ready to bring that correction, to call sin what it is, not just so that you can feel powerful. That's not the purpose of it. Not just so that you have something to do. But God brings correction because he wants to bring redemption. Correction is for the, the sake of redemption. Correction is for the sake of redemption. I'll Mom. say it again. Correction is for the sake of redemption. Prophetic people are bold, bold in correcting things that need to be corrected. Not angry, not confrontational per se, not unloving, not prideful, not arrogant. But they're bold in their warning. And sometimes the prophetic will bring warning. When you're correcting, make sure you're aligning with the word. And those are the nine signs that you are prophetic. Number one, discernment. Not the gift of criticism, the gift of discernment. Number two, words of knowledge. The acquisition of natural information through supernatural means. Number three, words of wisdom. This is the acquisition of wisdom through supernatural means. Prophetic dreams and visions. Foresight, that's looking into the future. Insight, looking into hearts and minds. Passion for God's word, which is the foundation of the prophetic. Number eight, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Your strength is your weakness and sensitivity is not just about how clearly you hear, but about how quickly you respond. It doesn't impress me if you're talking constantly about hearing God, but never doing anything with what you've heard. Number nine, boldness in warning. Those are the nine signs that you are prophetic. Let's pray now. Let's pray that God would stir up that gift within you. Come on. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for your people who you've anointed to walk in the prophetic. And I pray, Lord, that you would stir up that gift. Let them be attentive to your voice. Come on, I want you praying right now. Join your faith with mine right now. I pray you would touch your people, Lord. Let them come to know what it is to be used by you. I thank you, Father, that you're moving in our midst. Just let him touch you right now. The mighty flow of the anointing here. Someone watching right now, your left eye's just been healed. Thank you, Jesus. An elbow's just been healed. Thank you, Lord. There's a skin rash. It's going now in the name of Jesus. Tumors on the spine, right on the back of the neck. I rebuke that now in Jesus' name. Come on, church, begin to pray. There's a healing virtue flowing right now. And I want you to do this while we're praying. Put your prayer requests in the comment section, and even if I don't see it, the people of God will see it, and we're all joining faith together. Right now, put your prayer request out there. Put your prayer request out there. Thank you, Lord. 
I thank you, Jesus, for that healing virtue. I command eyes to be open, ears be open. Somebody issues with your shoulders, very, very, very sharp pain in your shoulders. I rebuke it now in Jesus' name. I rebuke paralysis, goes. Heart disease, go in the name of Jesus. We pray against cancer. We rebuke it now. I want you right now, just by faith, begin to put your prayer request on the comment section. God's doing something here. And Lord, stir up that gift. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Steve, how's the chat doing? The chat is doing amazing. And I see all of your prayer requests here. Um, so go ahead and continue to leave your prayer requests. And we'll see them and we'll pray for you. So thank you so much, guys. And again, I want to say thank you so much for liking this video. We're at 1.4 thousand right now. So that is amazing. Uh, you guys have liked all these videos or like this video. So our next goal is 2,000. So if you can do that for us, that'd be amazing. So we're right now, I think we're going to go ahead and go into the q and I want to say. Not just yet. Not yet. My, 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 my apologies there, my bro. No problem. No problem. I want to read a portion of scripture to you. It's found in John chapter 12, where the Bible says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about becoming that seed in the ground. Jesus said that if you try to save your life, if you try to hang on to it, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for his sake, you'll find it. Jesus is talking about surrender, sacrifice, giving your life for him. Now, so often we say things like, Lord, I want to surrender my life to you. I want you to have all of me. And by the way, we are going to get into the Q&A right now, so stick around. But I want you to hear this. We say, Lord, I want you to have all of me. I want you to take my life. It's yours. Spend it for your glory. We pray prayers like that. Help me surrender. Every little bit of me. Yet, many of us are unsurrendered. Many of us hang on to that spirit of mammon. And when I say spirit, I'm talking about mindset, attitude. We, we have this mindset that says, I trust in my riches, not in my God. The surrendered life is all about laying it all down for Jesus. See, money is not, it's not just a matter of money. It's a matter of our love. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your money and how you spend your money is a test of your love for him. Why? Because it means so much. To pretend that money isn't important would be, would be just deceiving ourselves. We know money is important. It's not the most important thing, but it is important. How do I know that? Because that's when people start to get offended. Well, why is he talking about money? Well, if money wasn't that important, why do people get so upset when you talk about it? That's the truth. And so I encourage you today to allow the Holy Spirit to relinquish you from self. Jesus has never held back from you. Don't hold back from him. When you give to this ministry, you're not just giving to a ministry. You're giving to him. You're giving to him. It's your gift to Jesus, to our Lord, our wonderful. Hasn't he been good to you? Hasn't he been wonderful? He saved you, delivered you, healed you. He's shown his mercies to you every morning. His presence marks your life. What more could we ask from him? For God so loved the world, he gave. His love moved him to give. So I want to challenge you today. I want to invite you today to lavish your love on Jesus. And give to this ministry by going right now to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Give a one-time gift or become a monthly partner with our ministry. 
Your one-time gifts and your monthly gifts help us continue doing everything that we do. We do events around the world, the encounter services. We do these live streams. We produce content for you. We have the Holy Spirit School, which is free. And the beautiful thing is we never charge for any of it. Freely we receive, so freely we give. We don't charge. Why? Because the gospel needs to go out. How are we able to give it out for free? It's because of people like you who stand with the Spirit family. I'm calling on you now. You are the most generous. You are the most loving. You are the most interactive online community of believers, and I love it. There's nothing like the Spirit family, and I'm calling on you now to give into this ministry that we might continue to do what we do. And if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell. Join the Spirit family. We're here every Wednesday at 6 p.m. We release content on the Holy Spirit, spiritual warfare, prayer. We show footage of the power of God in action. We do live streams from around the world. We feature Steve's worship ministry. God's moving. It's the Holy Spirit's channel. Join us. That peace that you sense, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. There's a lot of noise in the world today, a lot of clamor, a lot of, a lot of craziness going on. This is the presence of the Lord. There's peace, there's joy, there's excitement, there's life. And I want you to join us. But those of you giving, go to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Give a one-time gift right now. Give a gift of $25. If everyone watching right here gives $25, that would be great for this ministry. We have goals every week so that we can continue going and growing. All of it goes toward the ministry, the general fund, to help us continue doing what we're doing. Give a gift of $50. Maybe the next person won't give, so you make up for it, and you can take that blessing. Some of you can give 100 Some can do 1000 But whatever you do, do it now. One-time gifts, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. You can also partner there. Sign up to become a partner. $10 a month. What do you spend $10 a month on? I mean, Netflix, Hulu, Starbucks, movie tickets, hmm. dinners, whatever it may be. You can continue to do those things, but also consider the gospel. Support this ministry, $10 a month, $30 a month, $100 a month. Do it now. As you begin to give, I'll be able to see your names coming in on my phone if you give through davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. And we sure do appreciate your giving. We honor you for it. As the names come in, I will say thank you. I see on the super chat, <clears throat> Tammy... And I also see Lindsey Graham. So guys, just a little disclaimer. My, my, my voice is a little weak. I've been preaching pretty much all week. I'm doing this live stream tonight. I will be preaching tomorrow morning again. Well, this is airing on what's the date today? We have August 4th. So I preach again tomorrow morning, August 5th, 2021. So I'm kind of talking a little more reserved. And then the air conditioner was messing with my voice. So I'll pray for healing in my voice right now. God can do it. We believe in miracles. Mm -hmm. But I want to thank uh, Isabel for giving a one-time gift. Thank you, Isabel. Amen, amen, gave a one-time gift. I think that was anonymous. Carmen, thank you for your gift. I see Umakanthan, thank you for your gift. And Taya and Margaret and Nini and James and Carla and Miamete and so many of you giving now. Wow. Gian also gave. And then I see the Patrick family, our dear friends, Ronald, our dear friend Ronald Taylor gave a one-time gift. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All of this support counts, guys. You may think, oh, it's just my gift. I'm, others will do it. No, no, no. That's the beauty of unity is we can all participate. So if all of us are of the mindset of, oh, there's a lot of people watching, all the people will give, then no one will ever give. But if all of us are of the mindset of, hey, there's a lot of people watching, wow, what happens if we all give? Then God does a wonderful thing. And it's all for the work of the gospel. Don't worry about the future. The Lord's going to take care of you. Don't worry about what the news is saying. Don't worry about what they're saying about the coming days. You're in God's hands. And that security in him is what enables you to give toward the gospel. So do that now. Oh, thank you, Kate, for becoming a partner. Wow, thank you, Kate. And then Vanessa became a partner as well. And then Frank and Joanne, thank you for your gift. Thank you, Kate, for partnering. Thank you, Vanessa, for partnering. Thank you to uh, Tatiana for partnering. Thank you for TA for your one-time gift and Pam and Galen Mays. And thank you also to Miro and so many others, so many others continuing to give. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see the super chat, Vita Roberts. 
it's just coming in from around the world. So we're, we're thankful to you guys. I can't say thank you enough. Um, I don't take it for granted. Um, we so appreciate you. Uh, your support means the world to me to know you're standing with me and going with me around the world. Really, when, when you give like this, that means that wherever Steve and I go, you're going with us. You're part of it. You're part of it. That's the fact. So thank you for your giving. Don't forget to like. Oh, my goodness, Steve. They're at 1.5 thousand likes at this 1. point. 1.5. Amazing. If you get Amazing. to 2,000, that's the ministry trip right there. If you get to 2,000 likes, wow, that's wow, the ministry wow. trip. That would be interesting. It would be a first time. So here's what I'll do. I will announce the book winner, Kim Shara. Kim Shara is our book winner. Usually I do the fanfare and the drag it out, but I want to get to the Q&A. Kim Shara, you're the book winner. Make sure you contact our ministry. Uh, we're going to be sending you those books. And who knows, we might be doing a, a trip giveaway, but it has to be done while we're live. Okay, Steve, we are ready for the Q&A. Uh, Ruben, we're ready to drop that over in the comment section. Hold on, wait, before you do, Ruben. Ruben right now is going to put a Zoom link in the comment section. People of God, go to Zoom, ask your question, and then come back to YouTube. If you're not going to ask a question, there's no point in getting on Zoom. We want to maintain, we have a strong viewership. Guys, we've only been doing this format of live stream for what? Four weeks now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. About four weeks. And we're already averaging twelve to 1,300 on a live stream. That's huge. That, I mean, that takes about six months on average usually to build that kind of audience. And here our ministry is already seeing it within the first four weeks. This is incredible. So I, I want to see 10,000 concurrent viewers. And I think we'll go even further than that. 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. We are going to get there. So I'm going to remind you every Wednesday, 6 p.m., make it your thing. Come join us. If, um, you know, you're in a part of the world that's locked down, you can't get anywhere. This is a wonderful thing to do. If not, then, hey, join us anyway. The Spirit Family Meets, Wednesday, 6 p.m., Pacific Standard Time, right here on YouTube. So let's get that up to the next goal will be about 2,000 concurrent viewers. We're already averaging 12, 1,300, which is really good for just four weeks of this format of live stream. So thank you, guys. We love you. Um, but Ruben is going to drop the Zoom link in there. Please don't all migrate over there. There's nothing. I, I can't see you on Zoom. Just so you know, right now I can't. Usually I can, but in this setting, there's nowhere for me to see you. So go to Zoom, ask a question. The rest of you stay on YouTube. Okay, Ruben, go ahead with that Zoom link. And Steve, go ahead uh, with setting them up for questions. All right. So if you guys want your questions answered here on YouTube, all you got to do is go ahead and leave them in the comment section where you've been commenting all night, and it's been so amazing to see all your comments. So again, if you want your question answered, I will be looking at them as many as I possibly can over on YouTube. So we're going to go ahead right now. I have a few questions that were asked earlier, but I wanted to save them for right now. Um, and I want to go ahead and start off this Q&A with a question from our friend Dominic. And Dominic said, uh, is deja vu, is deja vu spiritual? It could be. I don't have a, a, a certain answer on that because the scripture isn't specific on that. So where the scripture is unclear, never be dogmatic. Now, this is where I was talking about prophetic people being very sensitive. We are sensitive. And what I've noticed is that when you don't agree with them on certain things, they get kind of offended. So if I say, oh, deja vu isn't spiritual, they say, well, I believe it is, and they kind of get worked up and upset about it. These are the types of things, just as an example, on a side note, that's a good example and good training in the spiritual realm so that you can learn to not be worked up by these things. But anyway, that's on a side note, specifically on deja vu. Um, it could be. I, I don't know everything. I only know what the scripture says. And so God can use deja vu. If God uses deja vu, then there's a spiritual element to it. It's also possible that sometimes deja vu is spiritual, sometimes it, it's not. It could be physiological. It could be circumstantial. There's a, there are many factors that can play into it. I don't know what it is exactly. There are theories on what it might be. Um, it could be spiritual. My short answer, I don't know. The scripture doesn't specifically say. So it could be. It could not be. But don't get too focused. These are the things, guys, I mean when, when we get off the foundation of the word. So deja vu, I would never teach on it. I would never teach on it in a class and say, oh, guys, this could be the Why? It may be interesting, but teaching on deja vu, where's the fruit in that? 
Why would mm. I teach on something where the scripture is unclear? It's just, it's not going to bear much fruit. And then people become obsessed with that idea and it takes them on this trail down to the bizarre and the weird. Not that deja vu in and of itself is super strange, but it, it's the first step. You know, people start going into those directions and they want to get into everything. Is this spiritual? Is this spiritual? Is this spiritual? Is this prophetic? Is this prophetic? Is this prophetic? And it just leads you down this road to where you become distracted. So don't wander too far from the word. Never go that second layer. The first layer is deja vu, spiritual or prophetic. The first layer, well, it's not mentioned in scripture, so it could be. And that's where it stops. Don't go down that third, fourth, fifth layer to where now all of a sudden you get deja vu and you're freaking out saying, Lord, what are you trying to say to me? You know what I'm saying? Mm. It's, it's the application of these ideas that really can lead to uh, certain things that are concerning. So be careful with that. We thank you for that question. Before I jump into the next couple of questions here, I want to go ahead and thank a few people over on YouTube Super Chat. I want to go ahead and thank Carrie. I want to thank Early. I want to also thank, oh my goodness, they're flying by. I want to thank Ada. Thank you so much for your YouTube Super Chat. I want to thank our friend Dylan, and I want to thank our friend Dylan as well. He became an ETV insider, so welcome, welcome. That's awesome. And now awesome. he can use those emojis. He's unlocked the emojis, and I want to go ahead and thank Justin. So thank you guys so much for your YouTube Super Chat. I see them, and we appreciate them. We I love you. I got some people too, Steve, before you get into that. Go right ahead. Marina became a partner. Car Cara Dad, thank you for your gift. Nar, thank you for your gift. Kiana, thank you for becoming a partner. Gustavo, thank you for your gift. Eden, thank you for your gift. Uh, Angela, thank you for your gift. Uh, Nadine and Cynthia and Terry and Jackie and April, Alonzo, Kanzi, Angela again, and then Kidane. And um, also Chelsea became a partner and Denise gave a gift and Michelle became a partner and Ingrid became a partner and Chloe gave a gift and Mioyo gave a one-time gift. Uh, Aubrey gave a gift, Soledad. I mean, it's just coming in from all over the world. So thank you. Your generosity just overwhelms me. And um, we thank you for it. Steve? Okay, so this next question comes from our friend Morgan. Morgan on YouTube. Morgan wants to know, what do you do when a person claiming to be prophetic tries to manipulate you into doing things for them because they claim God told them to, but it goes against the word of God? Don't do it. And don't have contact with that person. If someone is telling you to do something that violates the word of God, I don't even know what to say to that. Right. I mean, I'm trying to be kind, but don't even, don't have anything to do with that person. That's the answer. All right. We thank you. And uh, I don't know if you wanted to jump over to Zoom yet, or we can do another one. I have another one here. Go for it, Steve. All right. This question comes from our friend, Carrie. Carrie wanted to know, I have given words of knowledge, but seem to be missing more than getting accurate. Does this mean it's not a gift of mine? Say it one more time. I want to make sure I'm understanding. Carrie wrote, I have, I have given words of knowledge, but I seem to be missing more than getting accurate. Does this mean it's not a gift of mine? It's possible that that's what that means. It's possible. I mean, because the gift will work if it's the Lord. I don't say that to discourage anyone because... Sometimes people do speak out of their emotions, out of their minds. And this doesn't mean that they're doing it with ill intent. Sometimes people very sincerely believe they're hearing from the Lord and they minister what they think is a word from God, and it turns out not to be the case. What you can do is calibrate or make adjustments. Try to pinpoint what was it I was feeling, sensing in that moment so that I know in the future that that's me and my thoughts and not necessarily the Lord. That might be a good practice. And after you calibrate that, if it still doesn't manifest after stepping out on faith, after praying, as they say, praying into it, then it's possible that that is not one of the gifts God's given you. But there are many different prophetic expressions, and it could be that you work in the prophetic in a different way. It doesn't mean you're not prophetic, but it could mean that the word of knowledge is not the way that God uses you in the prophetic. So it could be one of two things. It could be, A, you have the gift, and it's just not calibrated yet. Or it could be that the gift is not on your life, but that God will speak to you in other prophetic ways. Either way, nothing to be discouraged about. Keep pursuing the Lord, keep stepping out in faith, and keep asking Him to guide you as you learn to harness, calibrate, and use this gift. 
Amen. Keep on going. Keep on going. Okay, this question comes from our friend Kitty. Kitty wanted to know, in the lucid state, are we able to make choices like which direction to take at a fork in the road? I don't understand the question. I'm going to be honest with you. Are you talking about lucid dreaming? Yeah, I believe it was talking about when you were talking about prophetic dreams and visions. Um, you know, this is what I mean by adding the layers to the prophetic. I have nothing to say about lucid dreaming because the scripture has nothing to say about it. And if you want some guidance on it, get some guidance for some people who've had that experience maybe, but be very, very careful with this. This is what I'm talking about. Be very careful with this. We can't make doctrines out of these things and say this is for sure or this is certain. Can God speak to you in a lucid dream? Absolutely. God can use anything to speak to you. But should we therefore take what we've experienced and use it as a point of doctrine in regards to dreams and visions in the Lord? Uh, no, that's definitely not something we should be doing. Um, so as far as lucid dreaming, I don't have much commentary on it because the scripture doesn't. Does God use dreams? Yes. Is lucid dreaming dreaming? Yes. So can God use a lucid dream? Yes. Beyond that, going into the details, exploring it, now you're starting to step off that foundation. It's not heresy. It's not uh, wrong or demonic to kind of explore that question and see it from different angles, but to create a doctrine upon which you base the you know, your, your entire prophetic ministry, that, or, or even a prophetic teaching, that's where you get into trouble. So don't leave the foundation of the word. Let's do one from Zoom. Ruben? Okay. The first one was, uh, Caitlin. Caitlin, welcome to Viral Revival, the Holy Spirit's live stream. What is your question? Hello? Hi. Hi, Pastor David. So I've been a bit confused. Um, I was under a ministry and well, Let me stop you just for a second. Is, I'm going to stop you. I want to, I want to say this just, and I'm so sorry, please forgive me for interrupting you. I just want to make sure don't name the ministry or the pastor. And this is something for all of our callers. When you call in, this is a very public forum. Don't name churches, pastors, ministries in any of the stories or questions just to be safe. I don't want to dishonor anyone or cause confusion or anything like that. So continue though. Okay, so um, I was a bit confused because she would tell me that like if I give her money, it would open her prophetic eye. And it's been confusing me because I don't know if this is scriptural or not. No. Nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible. That's manipulation. That, that, is, that is, that's not only manipulation. I, 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 will, I will be so bold as to say that's... That's, that's sorcery. Hmm. The exchange of the monetary for the spiritual is the definition of sorcery. You pay me and I'll do what you need. That's sorcery. That's, you didn't, you're not talking to a prophet. You're talking to a psychic. Wow. So that's the truth of the matter there. Uh, and now you see why I don't uh, do the whole name thing. But Ruben, who else we got? Jorman, welcome to Viral Revival, the Holy Spirit's live stream. What's your question, my friend? How you doing, Pastor? Uh, my question is, I'm new to the faith, and I wanted to know, is baptism necessary for entry into heaven? And is this something I should be pursuing immediately, or should I create a relationship with God first? Necessary for entry into heaven, no, but very important. Very, very important. I mean, we're talking about people, you know, across the world who— possibly maybe get saved and then they're persecuted before they ever get into baptism. And I know of stories of people who got saved, practiced their faith, and before they ever made it to their baptism, they were beheaded. Uh, but it, we are commanded to be baptized. It's something we should do. It's something we should practice. It's a very important thing that we ought to do. Now, I know there's going to be a myriad of disagreements on this particular topic, but, you know, the scripture is clear that we're saved by grace through faith. In who? In Christ Jesus, the finished work of the cross. So anything added to that that's works, now you're getting into a works-based gospel. Now, if I'm truly saved, I want to obey the commands that God has given me. And in wanting to obey his commands, I will want to be baptized. So salvation 
produces works, but works can never produce salvation. So when I am saved, I receive the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 makes it clear that I can't belong to God unless I have the Holy Spirit. Mm. So when I'm saved, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in me, and he starts to give me desires. What are those desires? Romans 8, 26, uh, desires, groanings, what? According to the will of God. What is the will of God? It's found in the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit inclines my heart. He bends me toward the will of God. And in doing so, he's going to cause me to want to fulfill every command that God has given to me. And baptism is more than just being put in water. See, there's nothing that's symbolic in the New Testament or strictly symbolic. Otherwise, what we have is powerless religious ritual. So like communion, it's not literally physically turning into flesh, but in the spirit, we are communing with the Lord. Baptism, when we're being placed under those waters, yeah, it's physical water, but there's something actually happening in that act, a very spiritual thing. And this is why people have encounters with God while being baptized. So baptism is very, very, very important. But if you die, you know, you're scheduled to be baptized and you die, you slip you're, you're walking into the tub and you slip and break your neck before you're baptized. Let's just say that worst case scenario. You're not going to go to hell because you missed that, okay? So no, it's not a requirement for salvation, but it is a requirement. Okay, next question. Sherry Ann, Sherry Ann welcome to Viral Revival. What's your question? Hi, um, thanks for taking me. Um, I did have a question regarding... Um, like words that people can release prophetically. So I understand that prophecy is meant to correct, encourage, or edify. But recently I met somebody, and obviously I know you not no mentioning of names. Mm -hmm. um, they released a word and it was very, very hurtful to me. Mm. And it didn't correct, but it actually like, hurt my feelings. It was more like um, they would list like a Jewish animal that was like unclean and then be like, oh, God revealed to me, like, that's what you are. Or that's who you are. And I'm like, that doesn't, I, I mean, is that possible? Or is that, I think it was very hurtful, but at the same time, I'm also the type of person that if the Lord wants me to repent over something, I have no problem doing that. If they were so, so if they were so prophetic, not only would they have given you the animal, but they would have given you what, what, what it was that caused the Lord to say that about you. You look at all the prophets in the Old Testament and in the New, whenever they called someone out, like John calling out the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, he told them right. why he was telling them that. So this to me does not sound like a prophetic word, not even, in, not even close. Okay. Like scripturally speaking, okay. and I'm just kind of, when, when people ask me these questions, what I'm doing is I'm going back in the catalog, just kind of boom, 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 looking at different instances, trying to find where we would see that. And in this instance, there's no purpose. There's always a purpose to a prophetic word. So the purpose is never just to, to call you something negative. Even, God does call people negative things. You look at the Old Testament especially. God, God called people harlots, okay? So he, he calls right. them names but he gives the reason as to why he's calling them these names. So if there was no reason given, there was no direction, then it's not a prophetic word. Prophetic word is always going to give some type of direction, something that comes next. But this does not sound like it. So I, I would say toss it out. And, I, and I, you know what I like about you? I can tell that you're asking <laughs> this question because, yeah, it, it hurt you. But at the same time, you're like, I don't want to miss God on this. And, yeah. and that's what I like, that, that humility of, okay, I was offended, but I still need to have the humility to approach this and see what God is saying. I love that. And you don't think that God would respond to that? He resists the proud, but what? He gives grace to the humble. He would embrace that, and he would tell you, he would correct you, he would make it very clear. But the fact that nothing was made clear like that, um, I, I, I would say to you, based solely on Scripture— you have every right to toss that out and never think of that word again. Okay, thank you. God bless you. Okay, Ruben, who else do we have? Amanda, welcome to Viral Revival. What is your question? Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. 
Cool. Um, my question is, do you think um, bipolar disorder can be confused with being sensitive to the Spirit? Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of things that we can confuse for the Holy Spirit's voice and demonic activity. Um, so bipolar disorder, I don't understand it fully. I, I know a couple people who have it. And, you know, mental illness can be caused by demonic power, but not all mental illnesses are caused by demonic power. For example, I know a gentleman who was in a motorcycle accident, and when he hit his head, because of the, the, the buildup in his brain, it completely changed his personality until the swelling went down and until they were able to help him with certain medications and therapy. And I saw that firsthand. Here was a guy, Holy Ghost, filled with the Spirit, practiced the Word, lived with integrity, loved his family. I mean, you name it. Hits his head, and then he becomes this whole different person. And that wasn't demonic. That also obviously wasn't the Lord. So there are certain things physically about us that can affect behavior. And the Lord will help us overcome those things, of course. But bipolar disorder is one of those things that is based in the real world. And this is where people... I think the, the body of Christ, I think, can do more. Body of Christ does a good job, but can do more in this area um, of mental illness, because especially in our world, especially in the charismatic world, we, and I'll throw myself in there with, with everyone, we can sometimes identify something as being spiritual when it is in fact natural. And mm. people be, be, become tormented. Um, they go through never-ending cycles of needing deliverance. They feel guilty about what they're struggling with. Um, so again, mental illness can be spiritual, but not all mental illness is. So yes, bipolar disorder, OCD. I know people who have forms of OCD, and what happens with them is they'll have a thought, right? Um, you know, for something as simple as peel, the, peel the, the label off the water bottle. And they'll think it, and just a thought. And then once they ask the question, Lord, was that you? Oh, forget it. They're not going to be able to not do it because even if they go, well, is that the Lord? I don't think it is. Well, I don't want to miss him. Well, it could maybe it's just me being me. Well, I don't want to ignore God's voice. Well, I might just be being silly. And they go back and forth, back and forth because they had a thought. Then they ask the question, could this be the Lord? And then they obsess, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. They're compelled to obsess over that detail. Same thing is true of people who think they have demons when they don't. Now, people can be demon-possessed. We all know demon possession is a reality even today. Deliverance is a necessity to be practiced even today. But there are some people, sadly, who are dealing with OCD or anxiety or bipolar disorder who are spirit-filled people, practice the Word of God, pray, worship, love people. They, they're godly characters. They don't have any open doors in their life, um, as people would say. And they get caught up in this and they become obsessed. So you tell a person like that, well, you probably have a demon and you just don't know it. Well, of course, that's going to cause them to exhibit the behaviors of oppression because now you're putting it in their head and they can't get it out of their head. So this is why we have to be careful with the spiritual realm as it pertains to mental illness. Because just as you could have a sickness of the bladder or a sickness of the kidney or a sickness of the lung, so you can have a sickness of the brain. And it doesn't make you any less spiritual just because you struggle with that. Can it be spiritual? Yes. Can it be rooted in a spiritual thing? Yes. In fact, in a way, indirectly, all sickness came about as a result of sin. That's just the fallen world in which we live. And we have to be careful when navigating this for sure. Um, it can be caused. It could even be intensified and prolonged by demonic beings. They can harass you with deception. Remember, Christians are affected by the demonic realm through deception, strongholds. It's the only way demons can affect Christians. It's through deception. And so that's that battle, right? In the mind, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. So the way you can ground yourself is, again, coming back to the Word. And that is how I will answer that question. Steve, how's YouTube chat doing? Let's YouTube's get a question from YouTube's doing amazing. And I want to go ahead and get another question going here. This question came from our friend Aaron. Aaron wanted to know... Do you feel that God chooses to speak stronger in the late hour than the daytime hour? I feel most words come at night. Why is that? Any thought? Um, it could just be because you're most aware. I mean, personally, God speaks to me more often in the night. 
and I can't explain why that is. In fact, let me show you something. This is kind of cool. I forgot to mention this. I think I sent it to myself. I think, okay, yeah, let me think. Okay, Steve, I woke up this morning, mm -hmm. and as I was, like, I'm still asleep, and then I wake up, and I have this sermon in my head, the whole thing. Wow. And I saw the title, Sins of the Tongue. Hmm. Lying, slander, gossip, complaining, blasphemy, and accusation. Wow. All of that in my head when I woke uh -huh. up and I saw it, sins of the tongue. And I thought that's the topic we have to do. Sins yeah. of the tongue. Things you say that are sinful. Because Jesus said it's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out. And I heard that scripture when I was waking up too. All of it just boom, 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 boom. And it happened in the morning, which rarely happens for me, by the way. Wow. It's usually at night, but I have to wake up, pull my phone out and write down what I'm, I'm getting. But that, that just, the whole thing, boom, 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 boom. And all the sub points too. It's all in my head. I'm ready to preach this thing. I can preach this now. <laughs> but it was wow. just like, it was like a download in my mind. I was astonished at it. So anyway, I got to send that to, uh, to myself through email so I can put together the outline. But um, I, I think God can speak anytime. I mean, you see, there's visions of the night. There's, there's visions of the day. Um, deep sleep falling on people. Midday God speaks. Nighttime God speaks. Morning God, he can speak anytime. So no, I don't think there's an intensification of when God speaks. I think it's a case-by-case -case situation depending upon what the individual is experiencing at that moment. Are they attentive to the presence of God or not? So that's very key. Hmm. Let's do another YouTube one, Steve. All right, this question comes from our friend Micah. Micah wanted to know, what happened between Genesis 1 and 2? Is there a gap? So there's a theory that's called the gap theory. And the theory goes that before Adam and Eve were created, there was another human race that lived on the earth and that they were destroyed. The theory goes that there are millions, possibly billions of years between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And this has a lot to do, or I should say, this idea was formed primarily upon the Hebrew wording in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. You know, the, the earth was void and formless. That right there, that void and formless phrase, is found, I believe, in Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah, it's describing a city that was destroyed. So they say, oh, the earth had been destroyed, and there was something on there beforehand. However, I personally do not hold to this belief. Some wonderful people of God who've mentored me, who I love, hold to this. Some wonderful people of God who I love in ministry hold to this. And by the way, guys, differences don't have to become divisions. Mm, come on. Never take it personal when someone teaches against something that you teach. Just like you teach things against what other people teach, you don't have people in mind when you're doing it. You just teach it. So on this gap theory, don't take it personal if I'm teaching against it. I'm not teaching against anyone. I'm just addressing an idea and why I don't believe it's true. This idea here, I guess that would be against, but my point is you're not against people. You, you go back and forth with ideas, and it's good to do that. It's healthy to do that. The reason I don't believe the gap theory is because the Scripture makes it clear that it was by sin that death entered. It was not a world filled with death before there was sin. It was by one man's sin, Adam, that death entered. The scripture makes that abundantly clear, that it was through the sin of Adam that death entered. So then, if there was a pre-Adamic race, then that scripture is not true. Because if there was a pre-Adamic race, that means that death came before sin. It can't be the case. Because we know that it was by Adam's sin that death entered. And God called creation good, meaning complete, perfect, whole, mature, lacking nothing. Would God have said the earth was good if Adam and Eve were standing through layers of sediment 
upon the dead bodies of a pre-Adamic race? No. So that's where I stand on that.